Hello. We're waking up in a dangerous new moment in the Middle East. Iran has directly attacked Israel for the first time. American and UK jets have been part of the defence. Sirens over Jerusalem. More than 300 drones and missiles launched by Iran. A moment of new danger after months of conflict in Gaza. Israel, with American and Allied help, shot most of them down to limit the damage. President Biden in the Situation Room, promising unyielding US support. But there have been celebrations on the streets in Iran. Tensions between the two countries are nothing new, but it's the first time Iran has attacked its enemy directly. This matters. So this morning, we'll ask what happens now. So what have British planes been doing in skies overnight? Cabinet Minister Victoria Atkins is here. Labour's Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary, joins us too. The BBC's international editor, Jeremy Bowen, will help us understand what's going on. And with the local elections looming, Carla Denyer is here for the Green Party. Morning, morning. Welcome to the programme and welcome also to my trio at the desk with me for the duration. Ian Duncan-Smith, former Conservative leader. Bronwyn Maddox, foreign policy expert and boss of the think tank Chatham House. And longtime Labour backer and multi-million selling author John O'Farrell. A warm welcome to all three of you. you. Now, let's begin with last night's attacks, which took two took place too late for the first editions of the newspapers. So I want to show you straight away what has been going on. More than 300 drones were launched late last night from Iran, taking hours to reach the distance to Israel. Overnight then in Jerusalem, you could hear the sirens wailing, but air defense systems shot down the vast majority of objects over the city. Let's go straight to Israel. My colleague Lise Doucette is there on the ground for us this morning. Lise, what happened last night? Well, Laura, this time here and across the region, in fact, all the way to London, it was a nervous wait and watch to see how and when Iran would respond. And so it did in the early hours of the morning here. There were air raid sirens sounding across Jerusalem and indeed across Israel and we could see explosions erupting in the sky as Israel's prized air defense system the Iron Dome intercepted the drones and missiles a swarm of 300 projectiles that Iran launched from its territory into Israel. Israel says this morning that 99 percent of them were shot down by Israel, by the United Kingdom, by the US, by France, and also by Jordan, Jordan, neighboring Jordan, which said it also responded by shooting down, intercepting the drones which crossed its territory, heading here to Jerusalem. And it said it had to do that to protect its territory. Late last night, Iran said its retaliatory strike was over and it wanted to draw a line under it. But this morning, Israel says the confrontation is not over and it's still on full alert. It's interesting, Lise, you say there that the Israelis have said that the UK was involved in shooting down some of these projectiles. We haven't had that confirmation yet from the Ministry of Defence here. We'll talk to a cabinet minister in just a couple of minutes' time. But I just wonder, what is the atmosphere like in Israel this morning after that terrible night? It's calm. The last night it was announced that schools would be shut, all educational activities are also uh, ended. There would be no gatherings of more than a thousand people. Israel is heading towards the Passover holiday, so classes were already uh, going to close. This is, a, this is a country where people prepare for war. There's a system of air raid shelters. There's a home front app that tells people what they can do. It's also a country where people have great confidence in their armed forces. So of course, there is, they are a bit on edge. Many people are said to be staying at home. I can see that there's a nearby, there's a very popular mall. There are less people going to it. But for the people of Israel, 
like for people across this region, they know this is a moment fraught with risk and that a new chapter is being written in an all too turbulent region. Thank you, Lise. It's great to speak to you there on the ground in Jerusalem for us. Well, these attacks are a step it was hoped that Iran would not take. The regime has long been an enemy of Israel and, of course, a backer of Hamas, considered a terror group by many governments around the world, the organization that was behind the terrible assault on Israel on October the 7th. Tensions have been building during the months and months of Israeli bombardment of Gaza as the US and other allies of Israel have grown increasingly worried about how Israel is fighting the war. Israel is thought to have been behind an attack on the Iranian embassy in Syria. Since then, there have been fears of revenge. President Biden warning Iran not to strike. What is your message to Iran in this moment? Don't. But late last night, the attacks began hundreds of drones and missiles in the sky. American and allies jets helping Israel take them out. UK planes have been in the air over Iraq and Syria with the authority to shoot drones down. Last night, Rishi Sunak said he condemned the attacks in the strongest terms, saying Iran has once again demonstrated its intent on sowing chaos in its own backyard. The UK will continue to stand up for Israel's security. Well, we're together this morning on a very sober moment, but a really important one. Bronwyn, if you're a stranger to all of these complicated patterns and jigsaws of the Middle East, how, how can you explain what's going on here really simply for our audience? It's a big step into more seriousness, uh, more danger, if you like, in that Iran has for the first time um, attacked or tried to attack Israel directly. It's been causing, as your report was saying, all kinds of destabilization in the region, supporting Hamas, who, uh, who carried out the October 7th attacks, supporting Hezbollah up the north, supporting the Houthis, who are attacking the Red Sea from uh, one side. We've just put out a podcast saying Iran's got involved in Sudan on the other side of the Red Sea with a threat there. So it is causing all kinds of trouble and enjoying the, um, the strain on Israel's international reputation that has followed the... Um, the conflict in Gaza. But um, it does have half a point here in that Israel had uh, attacked Iran's embassy in Syria, which is treated under international law as a piece of your own soil. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're saying. You attacked our soil, happened to be in Syria. We're going to retaliate and we, we might, we're prepared to stop here. But the question is what Israel now does. Ian, do you think this attack was inevitable in a sense? Yeah, I do think it was inevitable. Um, the reason why the Israelis attacked uh, the uh, consulate in, uh, as they did is because it was being used as a planning center for Hezbollah, Hamas, and also the work in, uh, of the Houthi. So all of this were the reasons they went, but as soon as they did that, as one just said, it was almost certainly going to have uh, a response from them. Uh, the response is interesting because um, it involved quite a number of other nations mm. involved in this as well. I think Jordan's because it was overflying Jordan is the reason why they shot those down. But it was quite coordinated. It wasn't a sort of, we don't want to harm anybody gesture. They fired uh, their big ballistic missiles at Israel as well, which were hit by the Iron Dome. So it was a substantial attack in response. What happens next is now up to uh, the participants. And John, you're a long time supporter of the Labour Party. The UK is now involved in this too. We don't know exactly what UK planes were doing, but we know they were over the skies of Iraq and Syria. Um, how do you think Labour should respond to this? Well, those planes are often over Iraq and Syria, um, but for British armed forces to get involved in this conflict is a big step, it seems to me. And it feels like something that Parliament should be discussing rather than just an executive decision taking it Downing Street, or maybe that didn't, that didn't even happen. Um, this is a terrifying situation. This is a war with very many moral ambiguities. And uh, the idea that Britain jumps straight into Israel's side on this will not sit comfortably with many people in the Labour Party and many people across the country, I think. OK, perhaps also some people watching at home. All three of you, thank you very much indeed for now. We'll be back with you a bit later. And Jeremy Bowen will also join us in the programme to help us understand not just what's going on, but, as Bronwyn was suggesting, what might happen next. As we've been discussing, the UK is playing a part in this, whether you like it or not. We can show you the live pictures of Jerusalem, where we were just talking to Lise. 
And also we can see what has been happening in Tel Aviv this morning, where Israelis right across the country are grappling with a new fact that after months of conflict, Iran has carried out for the first time a direct attack on their new soil. That is different, despite the fact the two countries have been rivals and enemies for many, many years. As we've been saying, the Israeli air defences appear to have foiled the vast, vast majority of missiles and drones that included support in the skies over Iraq and Syria from the UK. Let's, if we can, find out more about the British role in all of this. Welcome to the studio, Victoria Atkins, the Secretary of State for Health. I know this is a very sensitive situation, but what can you tell us about the UK's involvement in this? We know our planes were in the skies over Iraq and Syria. As you understand it, did they shoot anything down? Well, this was an incredibly significant attack on Israel. Uh, and uh, what I'm able to say at the moment, I hope viewers at home will understand, it's a live uh, military situation. I am limited in what uh, I can say at this point, and there will be updates through the day. But I can confirm that uh, British planes were sent to the region as part of our uh, what's called Operation Shader. That's our anti-Daesh initiative over Iraq and Syria. I I'm not uh, in a position at the moment to confirm or deny whether they took part in any of the uh, activity you've just uh, described. But they are they have, more planes were sent to the region, and uh, I'm told that they will uh, intercept. Uh, airborne mes missiles if they uh, threaten the existing missions that the UK already undertaking in the region. But that does not, I'm just being very careful here, it doesn't necessarily mean that happened last night. But does it mean that if there were more attacks like this, more Iranian dr drones being sent over to that part of the world with the aim of attacking Israel, they may shoot them down if there is another attack like this? So the, uh, the U United Kingdom, along with our international allies, are very, very focused on uh, de-escalating this. We do not want this to go further. We, know, we all understand how uh, difficult and sensitive it is in the region at the moment. And so all of our diplomatic efforts uh, are in that vein. In terms of um, the uh, jets or the resources that are in the region, uh, they, they will um, protect existing missions, but that is as far as I can go. And in terms, though, of the decision to be involved in this, can you shed any light on how this came about? Was this a request from Israel? Was this a product of discussions with the White House? Can you shed any light on why UK jets were given this authorization? So in terms of the uh, decision-making process, again, I, I'm afraid I can't give a running commentary at this stage, and, and there will be further updates in due course. But the Prime Minister held a COBRA meeting on Friday. He had updates throughout the day and indeed during the night uh, yesterday and, and uh, last night and has been on calls this morning. We also uh, are anticipating that a G7 leaders call will be scheduled and of course the Prime Minister will be at that. And was the Cabinet consulted before this decision was taken? Again, I cannot, I'm afraid at this stage, com give a running commentary oh, on the decision That's not a running process. commentary though, because you've, well, you've told us there was a COBRA meeting, that's the government's emergency exactly. committee. So, so there were a number of people, like, probably uh, uh, probably quite a lot of people in Whitehall would have been involved in a process like that. Was the British cabinet consulted before this decision was so taken? So with COBRA meetings, of course, there are relevant cabinet ministers in that meeting. You will appreciate the circle of knowledge on this has to be very, very tight because of the um, sensitivities and the, the danger that is involved for everyone in the region. And so I, I can gi I've given you as much as I can, Laura, and I very much hope you'll understand uh, in the circumstances. Well, and of course, if there's an update while we're on air this yep. morning, we will, we will let viewers, if we have additional information. In terms of what happens next, what would your message be to Israel now? Well, uh, the Foreign Secretary met his Iranian counterpart on Thursday to deliver the message very directly that uh, Iran must not escalate matters in the region. We Didn't will continue. Listen. We will continue with that message. We want this to be contained. What we want is a, a, an immediate humanitarian pause in the region so that we can get the hostages out um, that are still held captive, the Israeli hostages, uh, victims of that horrific attack in October. We want to um, get humanitarian aid into the region as well. But we also have to look to the future. And so our approach has very much been about ensuring that the government of Palestine is in a position to uh, 
really you know, to, to um, uh, strengthen the two-state solution. Hamas cannot be part but, of that. But forgive me, but Secretary that's the very long-term vision. You, you mentioned that David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, told the Iranians last week not to go ahead with an attack. They went ahead with an attack for many months. The UK and increasingly also the US has been saying to Israel on the other side, you must be much more careful in the prosecution of their war in Gaza. There's not much evidence that they have been listening. So why do you think now the UK and the US might be able to persuade Iran and Israel not to take this further? Because it, it's not just the US and the UK, of course, we have a, a range of free democracies who stand alongside Israel, which is you know, the, the uh, single democracy in that region. And we very much want to protect the freedoms that that uh, gives to the people of uh, Israel. But we also want to work with the com international community to ensure that tensions do not raise further or do not rise further than they already have done of course we acknowledge the difference that the last 12 hours has made but we are absolutely focused on containing this and in the difference that the last 12 hours has made how would you describe that, that difference i mean do you worry that this is a dangerous new chapter I, I, this is as has already been described in your program this is a significant attack on israel uh, and we you know i think everybody recognizes that that is why the president uh, has uh, indicated he wishes to hold a G7 leaders call. This is why we have taken this step of sending UK jets to the region as part of our existing uh, missions there. But I don't think anyone can um, resolve from the fact that this is a significant attack. And what we want to try and do now is to de-escalate and to contain it. Is it time though then, as many of your colleagues have wanted the government to do for a long time, to prescribe the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. In, otherwise, in other words, change the law to say that is a terrorist organization and should be treated as such. So the Foreign Secretary dealt with this this weekend. Um, of course, we keep all of these issues uh, under constant review. But under but review two... means we might, we might not. Yeah. For a long time, some of your colleagues have been saying you must actually call out Iran much more firmly and say that the yeah. Revolutionary Guard is a terrorist organization and treat them as such. So, to, so as the Foreign Secretary explained this weekend, there are two reasons why we have not taken that decision thus far. First we believe that the police, the security services and the courts here in the UK have the powers that they need uh, to target uh, those people who are um, causing uh, the most uh, concern and indeed we have sanctioned some 400 individuals and entities uh, from Iran in, here in the UK. But secondly there is uh, a point of, of the value of being able to have a direct conversation with the Iranian authorities in the way that uh, has already happened. There is a value in that to be able to land those messages directly with Iran. And so those are two of the factors that have been borne in mind as part of this. So you because haven't made say, your mind up yet? That, that's not fair because we have to, you know, this is a very fast moving situation, as I say. All of these prescription conversations are always kept under um, review. And indeed, when we've talked about other organisations in the past, there is something also about, you know, we have to be careful about how this is communicated and so on. But um, it is very much kept under review and we are very alive to the last 12 hours. Given what's happened, not just in the last 12 hours, but in the last few weeks, isn't it actually time to increase defence spending? You know, the government's target is to get to two and a half percent of the GDP, the sum of everything that we produce in the economy. The defence secretary himself is understood to want it to be three percent. Given what's going on, actually, isn't it just time to say to people, yes, we must do this, and that might mean spending being taken away from other places or it might mean new taxes or whatever. Isn't it actually time just to do that and be straight with people about the extent of the threats we face? We absolutely understand the emerging international situation. This is why we've had the integrated defence review. We've also, uh, in fairness, we have raised and continue to raise defence spending. We're now at about 2.3%. But not to the level that many people believe is required with the world as it is in 2024. And, and, and it's right also that within NATO, we are a, an incredibly significant player within NATO. I think we spend uh, our uh, total uh, spending on defence is equivalent to some the spending of some 20 other NATO members, just to put it into perspective. So, you know, defence will always be our priority. Uh, and as we have already continued to invest in defence, of course that will continue. And the Chancellor has set out his ambitions to do so. But we, we, also, we need to bring it back to what we can do today and over the following days and weeks. We have an amazing 
uh, armed forces. I'm very lucky to represent RAF Coningsby and I'm very conscious of the uh, toll that that takes on both the pilots and their families when missions happen overseas. But our investment and our commitment to uh, the defence community and to ensuring that our country is defended is absolutely paramount. And of course, we will always look to keep that under review. I just briefly want to ask you about something that's coming up this week. Um, legislation, draft laws will be in Parliament this week to progressively over time ban the sale of cigarettes. As a Conservative, why is it up to you to tell people what to do? Aren't you meant to be a party that uh, is like freedom? You know, some of your colleagues aren't very happy about it. And the former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, says it's nuts. Well, um, as Health Secretary, obviously I'm responsible for looking after not just uh, our health uh, and the NHS, but also I have to look to the future. And we know that smoking causes one in four cancer deaths. It's responsible for 80,000 deaths a year across the United Kingdom. And pretty much every minute of every single day, someone will be admitted to hospital with a smoking related condition. Now, every smoker I've ever spoken to in their adult years wishes they hadn't taken it up. And we know that the majority of smokers start smoking before the age of 20. So what we're trying to do is to say, young people, children aged 14 or 15 this year will not be able to buy cigarettes uh, from shops. That doesn't mean that if you're an adult watching this program today and you already smoke, we're not, we're not um, stopping you from buying them. We just want to stop our children from buying them. And protecting children, I think, is a very, very conservative value. Looking out for future generations is a very conservative value. And just as with the economy, we appreciate that a strong economy helps pay for the NHS. We also know a strong NHS helps a growing economy. Okay. And this is part of ensuring that we reduce the demand on our NHS in the years to come. OK, well, that will be in Parliament in the next few days, likely to go through, because Labour's backing you, not necessarily because all Conservatives are signed up, but Victoria Atkins, we're out space. of time. But thank you very much indeed for thank being you. with us on a really significant this morning. Now, that is all we've got time for with Victoria Atkins. But you, we want to know what you think this morning. You can always get in touch. Email kunzberg at bbc.co.uk. Or you can send us a message on X or Instagram at BBC Laura K. On this important day, of course, there'll be lots of information and explanation on the BBC website and the BBC News Channel all day. Let's return, though, to our main theme with Labour's Yvette Cooper, the Shadow Home Secretary. Welcome to the studio. It's good always morning, good to have Laura. you with us. Um, does Labour support the UK providing assistance to Israel in this situation? Well, we strongly condemn this attack by Iran on Israel, this reckless decision at a time when the international community has been urging restraint because everyone's greatest concern has been the potential escalation to a wider regional conflict. So we strongly condemn the uh, action that Iran has taken. It's really important that everyone uh, is working now hard to prevent further escalation. We obviously don't have confirmation yet as to what engagement has taken place from the UK. And I think it's important that we wait to hear that. But clearly, I think it's really important that uh, everything possible is done to prevent the further escalation, as the Prime Minister has said last night. Can you tell us if Keir Starmer was consulted before UK jets did get involved in this, whatever then happened? Because in this kind of situation, it is quite normal for the opposition leader to be brought on a confidential basis into some of these conversations. Again, I can't comment at this point on what discussions may or may not have taken place. Look, there are long-standing UK missions in the Middle East that, as you heard from Victoria Atkins, the government minister, are about uh, preventing Daesh activity mm -hmm. around Iraq and Syria, and we support those ongoing missions and the immensely professional work of our armed forces. But I, I think we, we still need to wait for the further information later today. The thing we do hope and expect to see, we do hope that there will be a statement from the Prime Minister in Parliament tomorrow. I think the, the seriousness of this, the real concerns about potential escalation mean that uh, we do need to hear from the Prime Minister in Parliament tomorrow. But are you, as a senior Labour figure, on principle, behind the, uh, the notion that UK jets should be part of working with other countries to help Israel defend itself in this way? Well, what is clearly important is that 
uh, actions taken to prevent the Iranian strikes and the drone strikes taking place. So because this is about obviously Israel's security, which is immensely important, but it's also about the security of Jordan, of Iraq, of other partners across the region. And it is about the stability of the Middle East. Obviously, this is at a time we cannot lose the focus on the devastating crisis that is happening to in Gaza. We also have to have the immense diplomatic effort underway now to prevent further escalation taking place. And nobody place. wants there to be escalation, of course, but that is quite a clear question of principle, though. Are, are you, as a Labour senior figure, happy for the UK to participate with other countries in Israel defending itself in this way? Well, again, we do obviously need to, to wait for what we hear from the government. But look, let's be clear, we support the existing government missions in the Middle East and continue to do so. That is important. We also think that it is important that action was taken overnight to prevent the uh, Iranian strikes on Israel because you know, we should be clear, if, if, if action hadn't been taken to prevent those strikes, we would have seen further escalation and further risk of widening conflict. But th this is the most important thing now that the Prime Minister has rightly talked about that said that no further, no one wants to see any further bloodshed in the Middle East. But we've also from the Labour Party talked, Keir Starmer has talked, David Lammy has talked, Lisa Landy has talked about the importance of preventing wider regional escalation. This is about security of everybody who lives in all the many different countries across the Middle East and the risks to them and the international risks of allowing escalation to take place. We know that Iran has a long history of destabilization attempts in the region through its support for Hezbollah, for Hamas, for uh, other actors across the region. And that's why everyone has been urging international, internationally has been urging restraint uh, and working so hard to prevent that further escalation and now. We're, and we're hoping before the end of the programme to speak mm. to a representative of the Israeli government to see what, if anything, they might do next. I'd like just to touch briefly on a couple of other subjects. Our viewers will be very familiar with the row that has been rumbling about your colleague, Angela Rayner. Um, she's been investigated by Greater Manchester Police over whether or not she did the right thing in terms of saying where she was living many years ago. Now, you and other colleagues have always said she did nothing wrong. You're confident of that. But isn't it, however, now time just for her to publish all of the details, then people can see it, move on. Well, Angela welcomes the opportunity to be able to set out all of the facts for the police, for HMRC, for the proper authorities, and uh, the hope that that will then just draw a line under all of this, because... I think she has done the right thing by taking independent tax and legal advice and she has been clear throughout this that she has acted in accordance with that advice. Now look this is about events that happened you know nearly 10 years ago before Angela became an MP. She has uh, set out information about her family arrangements and really I think, look, we, you know, she is very keen to be able to provide the, the facts to the appropriate but the, authorities. But, but actually, all of us need to get on with talking about the real issues that people are concerned about across the country, including issues that Angela has been campaigning so strongly but the, on, but the problem like is, support but, for but, working but the, people. But the problem is today, Yvette Cooper, one of our former advisers has um, made it known to the Sunday Times that he, they've given a statement to the police saying, actually, her account is not correct, contradicting her claims. Now, she's absolutely said she's confident she did nothing wrong, but surely she could move on from this just by publishing it all today if she's so sure she did nothing wrong. Well, I think Angela has been very clear. She will provide all of the information and she's very happy, not just very happy to answer questions from the police or, or HMRC, but actually she is very keen to because it allows her to set out all of the facts, not, not, not the sort of gossip, not the different allegations that we've had from Conservative MPs. And we understand this is the run-up to local elections. We have seen them do this before, as we saw over the Durham case as well. But, you know, what Angela, as our fantastic deputy, leader would do is to set out those facts for the appropriate authorities um, because this is obviously about her family arrangements her personal finances uh, and that's really how it should be dealt with instead now we were going to talk in detail about your plans for confronting violence yes. against women and girls um, if you win office of course events in the Middle East have rather taken over that but I just wondered 
in the wake of that terrible event in Bradford where a mum was killed in broad daylight, do you think as a society that we are taking violence against women and girls seriously enough? I don't. I think this is an epidemic of violence against women and girls that is simply not being taken seriously enough. I think the government's response has been far too passive. I think the, there are continued failings across policing and the criminal justice system that nobody is taking sufficient strong action on. We had a young mum killed in broad daylight while she was pushing a pram in Bradford. We had the awful case of Rani Uda who called 999 four times on the night that she was killed and no one came. We've still not seen the full overhaul of police standards that we need af needed after the murder of Sarah Everard. And that's why Labour is setting out a mission to halve violence against women and girls over 10 years, but also to overhaul the response of policing and the criminal justice system. It ranges from putting uh, domestic abuse specialists in 999 control rooms, overhauling protection orders, specialist action on, on rape. Uh, it, this is immensely important, but you're right, this is a society-wide issue as well. I don't want to see people desensitised mm. to the same threats to women and girls that we've seen through generations without action being taken. Okay, a huge job there to do, Yvette Cooper. We'll look forward to having you back and we can talk about those plans in more detail another time. But thank you very thank much you. indeed for now on this important morning. <laughs> Now, let's just remind you what's gone on overnight. Israel has shot down around 300 Iranian drones and missiles with the help of the US and other allies. We've been hearing from the Cabinet Minister Victoria Atkins on what the UK role was in all of this and what might happen next. Um, Bronwyn, you're a foreign policy expert. What did you make of how our politicians are trying to grapple with this in this country? Well, they've been careful about saying what the UK has done or hasn't done. But in a way, even though we know nothing about what actually the UK military has done, um, it, it, what the UK has clearly done is, is show support for Israel and Israel by saying that uh, British planes are in the sky around there, even if they've fired no shots, is able to claim and demonstrate that support. And is that uh, something that's unusual? You know, we heard the minister say, well, actually, it's part of existing operations. But I think a lot of people watching at home might not actually realise that British jets are regularly flying around in the Middle East. I think that's an important point, that they are doing that, uh, particularly in the skies over Iraq, and that they're maintaining some of the things that Britain has done, some of the more controversial things Britain has done, for example, in, in Iraq over the years and trying to maintain stability there. John, what did you think of what you heard? I thought that uh, poor Victoria Atkins was put in a difficult position there because no one seems to have told her anything. And she comes on live television and says, well, I can't give a running commentary. And what she really means is, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on, but she doesn't seem to have been uh, uh, fully briefed. I think the, um, the thing about what's happening in the Middle East right now is, obviously, Israel suffered an attack on October the 7th. But the, the, the response since has been so brutal, vicious and appalling uh, and with so many tens of thousands of uh, children in Gaza killed, that the idea that Britain is going to take military action to stand alongside Israel from the consequences that flow from this mm -hmm. is very dodgy in my, my, in my eyes. And I think lots of people will feel that. The idea that uh, we want to take sides in this war terrifies me, I have to say, and I don't feel comfortable with it. I'm very comfortable for us to support Ukraine. And um, that's very clear, you know, uh, the, the good, the, the rights and wrongs of that situation. But in the Middle East and in Israel, it's very different. <coughs> Ian. Uh, I think uh, we sort of put this into, into perspective. The reality is that the RAF have been flying over that area a lot. And they've also been intervening against uh, Iranian surrogates in the Red Sea mm -hmm. to try and protect international shipping. Now, the fact is, if a country fires that many drones across the area where they are, Syria uh, and Iraq, it's almost inevitable that you have no idea where they are absolutely directed. Drones are, uh, are flying very low and they could drop anywhere. You have no particular idea. So I think shooting them down is absolutely rational. It was rational for the Jordanians. I think it's rational for the <coughs> RAF to do that, uh, that the British government should say yes. Anything you have a view on, uh, you can take into action. We can view it as supporting Israel, but it's actually trying to stop harm and further death. And I think we should remember that the, uh, uh, the Iranians didn't just fire drones. They fired ballistic missiles at Israel, and Israel dealt with those themselves. So all I would say is it's a little bit more nuanced than people want to make out. The reality is 
that Iran has been involved in stirring up trouble in that region for some time. The attack by Hamas was planned by Iran, whatever else they say, Hezbollah is backed by them, the attacks on international shipping, backed by Iran. And we should, uh, uh, you raised this question earlier on, I absolutely agree, we should be prescribing the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard mm -hmm. Corps. They have two banks here in the UK funding a lot of the uh, extremism that takes place now in amongst some of the Islamic community. All of that has to be dealt with that's the way. From and what you say though, because John's expressing a view, many of our viewers might think yeah. actually really uncomfortable about standing alongside Israel in this, but Ian's making the case actually Iran, you know, Iran does get, got, got what they were asking for in a sense. Iran has been causing a huge amount of trouble, including uh, backing uh, Hamas in, in, uh, in the October 7th attacks. Mm -hmm. um, but my concern about British military presence in this is that it does escalate things. It begins to remove the option of responding in other ways, as Ian Duncan Smith was just, just saying, mm -hmm. through sanctions and whatever. It, it, it brings immediately a military response to this on Israel's side. That is an escalation. And Israel, it seems to me, could and should have thought uh, perhaps more carefully after mm -hmm. Oct October 7th where this military action was going to get to because it has fallen, I think, into the trap that Hamas wanted mm -hmm. of taking such extensive action, causing so many civilian deaths that it is losing the world's support. OK. Um, John, we'll be talking later about what effect this has on politics here or not. But as uh, someone connected to the Labour Party, I want to ask you, though, about Angela Rayner and about the rumbling row about this. And clearly the Conservatives have been trying to pull strings here and keeping this in the public eye and in the newspapers and some of the newspapers are very hungry for a story like this. What do you think though of how the party's handled it? Because some people on the inside of the party think they could have nipped it in the bud a long time ago if she'd been more proactive at the beginning. I think this is such a ridiculous non-story and uh when we're sitting here and we've got, you know, uh, war in Ukraine, war in the Middle East, and we're talking about something that happened that long ago, mm. something that the police were, could only prosecute within the first year after it happening. This was in the FT yesterday, that if the police were going to take any action about these alleged uh, financial misdemeanors, that would have had to be in the first year. So everyone in Manchester right now, I hope all the crimes that you've endured have been sorted because the Manchester police are spending <laughs> time on this. And Laura, I have to say, for, for, for you as a broadcaster and for the BBC here to keep spending time on this and to have Yvette Cooper sit here and come and talk about violence against women and girls and that to take second place to this bit of gossip that the Mail has pushed and pushed and pushed and for the BBC to have to say, we have to cover this because the Mail have keep covering it and keep covering it and well, so it becomes a story and it's not a story just because the Mail says it's I a story. I think a lot of viewers would think that Greater Manchester Police aren't exactly a bunch of sort of pussycats who just investigate something They're because the Tory MP tells them to but Ian Duncan Smith, I'd like you to respond to this because he's essentially said this is just the Tories playing fun and games, move on, there's nothing to see. What do you say to that? I, I hate all this personal attack stuff myself. I, I, I think it uh, ultimately demeans us. But um, it has to be said that Angela Rayner has pursued other people on almost exactly that. She spends a lot of her time calling on people to resign in, ad, in, in advance of any investigation. So, you know, if you're going to play that game, then it's going to come back onto you. I wish we wouldn't do it constantly in politics. Uh, I agree, there's many bigger issues to discuss uh, that we won't get round to, but that reality is the case, that were this to be a Conservative that had done this, I'm certain that Angela Rayner would have been calling to Although resign. I wish we'd stop it, but that's what are, she did. We're sort of talking about potentially are in completely different universes. Of you know, Nadim so. Zahawi's was, was his yeah. tax for fares yeah. were about millions of pounds. This is potentially about, yeah. I think, 3,000 pounds, which is a lot of money, but completely different. Well, I think the question really here isn't about the amounts of money, it's about what was your intent? If you are a politician at the end of the day and you decide that even if you, before you became a politician, then the best thing to do is to say this is where it is, all open and leave it at that. So I just simply say, if we could stop all of this one day, it'd be great. But the reality is, you know, do as you would be done. By, well, uh, 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 and I think that's the case here. I'm OK. Afraid. All right. Well, all three of you, thank you very much indeed for such an interesting conversation. And huge events abroad we've been discussing do not stop politics at home. The Green Party broke records last year and in a few weeks they hope they can do it again and win big in the local elections in England that are coming thick and fast. At the launch of their campaign in Bristol, top of the list was a promise to make it easier for voters to get a roof over the heads that they could afford. The Greens would like hundreds of thousands more council houses and controls on sky-high rents from landlords. 
Carla Zenyer, their co-leader, is here. Welcome to the studio, Carla. It's nice to have you big us, back with us this morning. Now, you kicked off your campaign focusing on housing. Do you accept that building more houses has to be part of the solution? Yes, absolutely. Um, we are aiming to create 150,000 new council homes a year, and we would do that through a mixture of new build and bringing empty homes back into use, conversions, and making it easier for councils to buy some of their supply off the market. And we think that those measures together are the best way of, of tackling the housing crisis, which so many are at the sharp end of. But it's interesting because you've said previously you expect to build no more new homes than in the decade of 2010 to 2019, when most experts actually think not nearly enough was built. So how many homes in total would the Greens likely like to see built? So we need to create many more affordable and many more social, so council or housing association homes. And that's going to be from a mixture of, of building new. And that will be a significant part of it. But can you tell us how many? Because this sort of accepted figure among experts is often around about 300,000 homes need to be built every year in places where people want to live to help make things easier and hopefully bring prices down. So how many exactly. would the Greens commit um, to? So the, the number we're committing to is the 150,000 creating new council homes. That definitely supply, you know, is part of the housing crisis, but just building more homes on its own is not going to tackle the housing crisis because the problem is that in so many parts of the country, what we're seeing being built is not what people need. So, for example, we see you know, large out-of-town developments of luxury, executive homes, four, five, six bed, double garage, and yet no bus service, no doctors or dentists, no, no more school places. Uh, and, and to be honest, they're not affordable for most of the people living in that area. So that's not meeting local needs. So but numbers are part of it, but we, we need to make sure that it's the right homes in the right place at the right price to actually tackle the housing but crisis. You can't tell us this morning how many new homes you would actually want to see built. Our proposals aren't broken down into that level of detail yet. Our manifesto will obviously be coming out closer to the election. But the top line is 150,000 new council homes a year and a suite of measures um, to enable local councils to do that, bu building themselves as well as um, buying off the market and, and bringing the many empty homes in this country back into use as well. But our viewers might be a bit confused about your stance on housing because last year your party won outright control of Mid-Suffolk Council, first time they had done that. I remember we talked to your colleague at that point, but they won that on the basis of a campaign that opposed house building and right now in Warrington, in Maidstone and in South Oxfordshire, where you've got councillors, they're calling for house building not to happen in their areas. So on the one hand, you're saying, yes, you want there to be more housing. It must be made available for the reasons you've described. But then you can't tell us how many new houses you would actually build. And in some parts of the country, you're saying don't do it at all. So I'm, I'm not sure that it's quite true that in Mid-Suffolk the campaign was based on opposing housing. That was a large the campaign was about making sure we have the right kind of homes in the right place at the right price. So it's perfectly legitimate for Green councillors to challenge a housing development that is unaffordable and doesn't meet local need, that isn't even in line with local councils' own planning policies. And so, yes, inevitably, your researchers will be able to find two or three examples across the whole country, given that we've got Greens on 170 councils across England and Wales. Now, of course, your researchers will be able to find a couple of examples where Greens have voted against housing because it doesn't meet local need. But what you will see is where Greens have been in administration, which is in over 10% of councils in England and Wales now, Greens have often led on, on huge amounts of building new, affordable and low carbon housing. Like in York, for example, we had the housing portfolio for four years, built award-winning, low-carbon and affordable housing in that time. Just briefly, we've spoken a lot this morning about Iran's attacks on Israel. Do you support the UK being involved in helping Israel defend itself? Well, first of all, I think that the news that we've had overnight is extremely concerning and the top priority for the UK government has to be seeking de-escalation in this situation as far as possible. I know there'll be a UN, UN Security Council meeting later this morning and I really hope that that will be the UK government's priority. Um, we, 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 we've seen news and I, I know we'll be receiving more news as the morning progresses on what exactly the nature of the UK involvement has been so far. We don't have all that information yet as far as I understand. Um, I 
think, you know, you'll be aware that as Greens, we uh, were calling for a suspension mm -hmm. of arms sales to Israel. It's worth noting that the UK um, provides a pretty small proportion of Israel's total arms. They're a major manufacturer themselves. But given that there is um, very clear evidence that Israel has been breaking international law, um, both in Gaza and um, although this doesn't justify really Iran's response at all. It is worth noting that Israel's attack was on diplomatic premises, which is itself breaking international law. Okay, well, Carla Daniel for the Greens, thanks very much indeed for joining us this morning. Thank it's you. always great to have you with us in the studio. Well, what Western politicians think and say in response to Iran's attacks really does matter. President Biden, we expect, is gathering G7 leaders together later today after he was briefed about the attacks in the White House Situation Room, a picture of that moment that the American government have shared online. A direct attack on Israel by Iran has never happened before. Here you can see the scene in the Israeli Defense Forces War Room. Now, I believe we can now join down the line um, the Jerusalem government spokesman, Avi Hyman. I hope you can hear us, Mr. Hyman. Thank you for being with us this morning. What is, Israel, what is Israel proposing to do now after Iran's attacks? Laura, Israel's woken up to a, a bittersweet morning. Uh, bitter because after pulling the strings in this war for the last six months, after funding its terror proxies um, in uh, Gaza, in Lebanon, in Syria, in, in Iraq, and uh, in Yemen, uh, Iran has taken off their mask and attacked us for the first time directly. Um, we thank our strategic support, our strategic allies um, for standing with us at this uh, difficult time. And we're glad that we were able, it is sweet morning, because we're glad that it didn't end much, much worse. Um, we are prepared for all scenarios, both defensive and offensive. And uh, we won't be uh, broadcasting uh, any plans or, or anything like that. It, it is under consideration still. So the Iranians say that their attack was in retaliation to Israel's attack on their embassy in Syria. Will you admit or explain Israel's role in that? Well, firstly, I'm not going to speak directly to that, uh, th that strike. What I can tell you definitively, definitively, is that that... Uh, that attack occurred in a place that was not an embassy, that was not a consulate, that was not any kind of diplomatic mission. It was an Al-Quds force military position. Um, the people there were, were active members of the Iranian Al-Quds force, and they were there, um, I'm sure, seeking, uh, se seeking harm on Israel. Um, we will continue to do uh, what we need to do to defend our, our, our nation. And again, um, I, it would appear that uh, Iran uh, wanted to do some serious damage, and thankfully they didn't. Although one 10-year-old girl is currently fighting for her life, um, a, small, uh, a young 7-year-old Israeli Muslim girl um, who was hit by shrapnel last night. You say your response to Iran is still under consideration, and I know that you've made it clear you're not going to tell us exactly what Israel might plan. But will you heed the call we've heard in this studio this morning and from the White House last night, a call for restraint, a call for de-escalation? Laura, we didn't start this war. We didn't want this war. This is Iranian aggression, Iranian aggression that we have seen for decades. Iran funding their proxies to attack us. And now, again, they have taken off the mask. There was a time in recent history, in living memory, where Jews could not defend ourselves, where we were defenseless. That is no longer the situation. And again, we are, we are able and willing to defend ourselves, to act defensively and offensively. And we stand shoulder to shoulder with our, with our allies at this difficult time. So the, the finger should be pointed to Tehran, who started this war, who, uh, who turned up the volume uh, last night. And we, will, we have always seeked peace and security for our people in the region, while they have always um, attempted to uh, engulf the region in, in war. Um, they, are, they say that we are the small Satan in their mind and that the West is the great Satan. So we again thank, uh, thank uh, our allies for their support and we will stand steadfast. Avi Hyman, thank you so much for joining us this morning from Israel. Thank you for your time. Well, we're joined, as promised, by our international editor, Jeremy Bowen. It's great to have you in the studio with us, uh, Jeremy.
a bittersweet moment. It was described by the Israeli spokesperson there. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't tell us specifically what Israel's response would be, but it's pretty clear from his words that a military response is on the table from the kind of language that he was using. But from your conversations, what do you assess will happen next? Well, what I've picked up from senior Western diplomatic sources is that to, to quote one of them, it's been a long night, now it's time to draw a line under this. That the Israelis, with the help of their allies, have ha have a victory, that Netanyahu is looking stronger at the moment, and please do not, the message is, go ahead and try and perhaps attack Iranian soil, because that really would be another escalation. The Iranians have been signalling very clearly for the last, well, since April the 1st, when that attack took place in Damascus that they will have to do something about it. They reject the idea, as many people do around the world, that that wasn't a diplomatic compound. I actually know the premises. I've passed it many times. Not allowed in, in Damascus, but passed it. And it is very much where their embassy is. So when Israel says, as we just heard, oh, no, that was being used by Al-Quds, that was being used to do damage, to plot things, that mm. it was not a proper diplomatic base, that spin? Well, uh, it may well be that, uh, well, the guys certainly were there, of course. And the... The IRGC is part of the Iranian armed forces, so they would argue that they had their military people in their embassy. It's not exactly unheard of to have senior military officers in a country's embassy. Lo loads of countries do that. It doesn't necessarily make it into a military target. Mm -hmm. But I think the point is now, as far as the region is concerned, that the ball is quite in Israel's court because that is the big fear for the Americans, the Brits, a load of people have had, is escalation. How do you stop that happening? And what is, do you think, the impact on the conflict in Gaza? Because it, what you suggested something's really interesting is that actually Netanyahu might be able to claim something of a win here mm -hmm. because the drones and missiles didn't get through, whereas the hostages are mm -hmm. still being held, the conflict is still raging in Gaza, and he's under huge pressure from the international community for going too far. I think this is an excellent morning for Netanyahu. I think Netanyahu is now, the conversation has changed. A few days ago, it was all about uh, the rifts between the Americans and the Israelis and the West, the wider West as well, about the famine caused by Israel's siege, uh, about the conduct of the Israeli army inside Gaza. Now the headlines are asserting the alliance, the coalition, uh, it's interesting, though, that uh, Joe Biden, in his statement, he said, I'd like to summon the G7 for a diplomatic response. Didn't say, wasn't talking about military. And the impact that that change of tone, remarkable really in a night, might have on the conflict in Gaza? Uh, I think the conflict in Gaza continues. I think the essentials of that don't change. There's a massive humanitarian emergency there. And that, of course, they are trying, the West, and is, is forcing Israel to do more. But as international organizations would say, there is so much to do. Jeremy, it's great to have you with us in the, the studio. And thank you for all the times you've come to talk to our viewers in the last few very busy months for you. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much indeed. Now, it is nearly 10 o'clock. Time has raced by on such an important morning. Earlier, I asked the Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, whether any British planes were involved in shooting down Iranian drones last night. This is what she had to say. I can confirm that uh, British planes were sent to the region as part of our uh, what's called Operation Shader. That's our anti-Daesh initiative over Iraq and Syria. I I'm not uh, in a position at the moment to confirm or deny whether they took part in any of the uh, activity you've just uh, described, but they are, they, uh, more planes were sent to the region. Well, let's have a last chat with my trio at the desk. Um, Ian Tucker-Smith, how do you think this will change our politics you know we're still in an election year um is this something that is going to change the tenor of the conversations do you think well i agree with you, jeremy i think things have moved a bit and i think the important thing uh, which we all want is an end to the fighting in gaza a ceasefire that both sides agree to and being able to get humanitarian aid in <clears throat> now i don't know whether uh, the uk's involvement with america's involvement uh, and even the Jordanians, allows, therefore, that greater pressure to be brought on the Israeli government to, to seek that, uh, seriously seek that ceasefire. But a ceasefire, people say, let's have a ceasefire now, only if both parties agree that they will stop fighting, otherwise it becomes a surrender. So you have to have an agreement. But it may just be that there's some scope for the UK and the Americans, I hope, 
to be able to try and seek a, a, a much more likely ceasefire and uh, a release of the hostages. Bronwyn, can you see that scenario where actually this could help things in a funny kind of way? If Israel doesn't respond militarily, and I very much hope that that is the case, that it doesn't do that, because then you've really got an escalation. Mm. But then we may be in a position when, as Ian Duncan Smith was saying, uh, countries can put more pressure on Israel and something is done about the humanitarian crisis there. But the big winner from this, or one of the big winners, is Putin, because this takes lots of attention away from the real trouble that Ukraine is in this year. John, we are still in an election year where there is, if the polls are right, likely to be a very big change politically in this country. But can you see this whole really serious, some people might say existential foreign policy conversation, actually changing how the election campaign goes? I don't think it will, to be honest, unless we see British troops go into action, which I think is very unlikely. I think people are going to be voting on cost of living, on the health service, on schools and hospitals. Those are the things that impact everyday lives and those are the issues that people are going to be thinking about when they vote in the local elections in May or the general or whenever that comes. Gaz has been a tricky vote for the Labour Party. It has been and it's quite a divisive is issue and um, it's something that may you may find some Labour activists more reluctant to go out for the Labour Party because of uh, Keir Starmer's uh, unwavering support for uh, Israel. But I think in fact when it comes to votes, I think people are going to uh, seek a change in the next government and they're going to they're going to be in voting be accordingly. Vote. Yeah. This does remind people that defence is a public service mm -hmm. yep. like health and education and arguably it's the most important thing the state has to do for its people. And the next time people have the opportunity to make a judgment on that is coming really, really soon. I mean, Ian, the local elections look like they're going to be pretty disastrous for your party. I mean, even you're, you're laughing when I ask you the well, question. <laughs> the assumption, of course. Um, no, I, I, I think that defence, I want to come back to this, is, uh, is important and I think I'm one of those who believes we do need to make a greater commitment to that rise in defence spending, uh, only if to give a greater lead to the Europeans to do the same. The second part about this, which Bronwyn brought up, which is really, really important, which does affect us, is the, the uh, Ukrainian war at the moment where Russia invaded them has had huge consequences mm -hmm. financially for us. The cost of living is hugely caused by that. If you think about that, foreign affairs impact on us. And the reality is right now, Ukraine is in a desperate situation because mm -hmm. uh, what happened was that there was this Hamas, terrible occasion of Hamas, which has taken America's focus away from Ukraine, which means Ukraine is likely to have real problems with Russia and we're going to have further consequences. So these well, really have big impacts domestically as much as they do uh, have we were, we, internationally. We were talking last week with the NATO boss about what he described as an authoritarian alliance of I these agree. hostile states around the world working together. But John, just to stick with politics here, because you're somebody you sort of made, made your name by making lots of, writing lots of excellent books and also making lots of, no, writing lots right of now. good, oh, well, I was wondering <laughs> if you were going to do that. But as a long time Labour activist, um, how do you see this sort of moment? You know, you've been a, a stalwart following them for a long time. I think it's. Uh, I think we do. We are going to see a sea change uh, at the next election. There are, you, you, there are times in politics, '79, you know, '19, Black Wednesday '92 to '97, when the, the 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 country just want to change. And I think we're approaching one of those. I don't want to take the next election for granted, but I do think that people uh, want to see the government changed. Uh, Ian Duncan Smith was talking about, you know, the, the impact of the cost of living over here of things like Ukraine. But we also, we can't change those. We can't stop them doing that. But we can stop Liz Truss's budget. We can stop Brexit. And those things are, is, have impacted us terribly. All right. Well, we didn't have time to talk about Liz Truss's book, which has been making some headlines. Oh, but no, we've no, had no, a fascinating, <laughs> we've had a very interesting <laughs> conversation with you three here this morning. It's been great to have you with us and great, of course, to have you with us. Thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us on a very significant day. We've woken up in what might look like a very different world where after months of raging conflict in the Middle East, a new reality in an old rivalry, Iran has directly attacked Israel and that may well change the big political and diplomatic game. There could be a nervous wait for Israel's next move and fears of a wider war are still there. Through the day, of course, my colleagues on the ground in the region and here in the UK will be giving you up-to-date information and trying to explain what's happening. But I will look forward to seeing you next Sunday, same time, same place.